Okay, performance improvement in the clinical microbiology lab. So what do we do? How do we make our processes better? How do we ensure the quality of the results that we put out? Um, <clears throat> you guys should know this by now. We've talked about this a thousand times. We talk about the pre-analytical value, the pre-analytical issues, analytical issues, and post-analytical issues. Okay, so we also, you also know that quality control is a huge part in the quality assurance piece of what we do. So we want to make sure that we're putting out accurate results. We want to be able to repeat those results if need be. Um, and we want to make sure that everything goes smoothly and we can help with the patient's care. <clears throat> So the pre-analytical, it's all about the specimen, what, what test is ordered, how, how it gets there, how it's collected, was it identified correctly, was it transported in the medium, did this person actually snap the little thingy that allows the transport medium to be in the right conditions. Um, and then there's the analytical piece of it, which is what we actually do for the testing in the laboratory. And post analytical is giving the results. Okay, reviewing the results. Do the results make sense? Um, then we need to get them out in a timely manner so that the treatment will actually be effective. Okay, and then even after all we did, they did give the right treatment. That's the other piece of it. <clears throat> so when we're looking at performance improvement or quality assurance, um, performance improvement is all about we want to improve our performance we want to continually make ourselves better and that is you know nobody's 100 percent perfect so that's why we start, started the whole quality improvement quality assurance um programs that we have and i would regularly look at people and say okay so you met all of your criteria you need to start looking at something else because there's got to be something that you're doing wrong so you have to constantly be looking to improve what is going on okay the the things that are happening um, so when we are looking at a continually to looking to continually improve the quality of the processes you have to sometimes look outside of where your realm is also so when we're looking at that pre-analytical piece a lot of times it's a matter of who's doing what <clears throat> so when we do when we're doing quality assessment, quality improvement, um, continuous quality improvement, one of the things that we are, it's like ingrained in us and it's super necessary is our quality control. And all quality control has to be documented. you will find in the microbiology department our quality control is a little it's a little different um than the standardized here here's your control here's your value here's your known values run this one liquid to do all of this that is not how it works in the microbiology department so yes we have gram positive and gram negative organisms yes you'll run into one of those at each point during the day and it, you know whether they're gram positive or gram negative by looking at them but you're going to gram stain something along those lines anyway because maybe you want to look at shape or or be just to verify that yes that's what i'm looking at um <clears throat> so if you see a gram positive and a gram negative organism your gram staining technique is is good so you can write that 
you did QC. You had two different organisms that were staying differently. Um, there are there are a lot of temperatures to be taken. You have to measure the carbon dioxide that's being piped into the incubator. You have to um, any of the kits that you use to identify organisms. You have to do the QC for those. Document, 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 document. Here's something that you probably did not know. When media is received into the laboratory, we need to inspect it and make sure that it is what it's supposed to be, that it actually looks the right way, that it performs the right way. And there are QC organisms that you have to put onto the media to make sure that it is performing correctly. So most of those are for specialized media, but I have had um, an entire shipment of blood auger that sat on the loading dock overnight and it froze. Couldn't use any of it because it wasn't received into our facility. The driver just dropped it and left it out on the loading dock. Um, and all of the red cells lysed. So you could not detect hemolysis on the blood. It was something that only ever happened once, but once was enough. Um, I, I will never forget it. And I'm sure that the people where we ordered it from, we're probably like, oh, this happens way too often for us. <laughs> um, but if something is, falls out of limits, you have to correct it. You have to figure out what went wrong. Why is it out of limits? And you have to work to get it back within acceptable limits. Okay. Told you there's a whole bunch of temperatures. There's temp temperatures required on all incubators, all heating baths, all... Um, Blocks, baths, refrigerators, freezers, room. A room that you're testing in needs to have a temperature taken. Um, if you do any testing at room temperature, you've got to have the room temperature. We also had, in microbiology, we also took not just room temperature, but we also took room humidity level because the humidity level could affect some of the testing that we did at bench on the bench. So it's very interesting. Um, National Institute of Standards and Technology have, you get thermometers that are calibrated by this institute and they have um, correction factors and things that you need to follow and all that wonderful stuff. And now there's the, the red liquid inside of them has re, red or blue liquid inside has replaced the silver or mercury. Um, You'll notice when you get out there that uh, our thermometers are in a glycerol solution. So you never do just plain old dry thermometers. So equipment QC. You want to make sure that the equipment is working properly. Uh, we have, you have automated, um, identification systems that do they do identification and susceptibility testing you have to make sure that they are working properly so you have QC for not just the reagents but also for the the equipment and the automated equipment um, has internal checks that are done every day and you're checking to make sure that things are working properly you have certain amounts of preventive maintenance that have to be done on a regular basis. Um, if someone slams a micro pipetter, drops it from the countertop to the ground, and it hits pretty hard, the calibration may be off on that. You should really check that. 
Um, <clears throat> so equipment testing, you're going to check your in, your incubator gets done every day. If you have a gas pack jar, which I have to tell you, the jars, um, jars are a kind of outdated, but not so much. I, we don't use jars as often as we use bags now. But if you have enough organisms that can fit into a jar, because a jar can hold like 10 or 12 organisms, and the bags only hold two to three plates at a time, um, you need to make sure that every time that you use an anaerobe bag, an anaerobe um, jar, that you're checking to make sure that it's, it's doing what it's supposed to be done. Uh, <clears throat> biohazardous, the... the Biological safety cabinet, they get checked at least annual they get checked annually. If for some reason you are moving the hood for any reason, then that all has to be checked again. Um, and there are people that that will come and do that. You guys don't do that. That somebody else does that. Um, and there's also you typically have the HEPA filter changed at the same time if you're smart. Um, centrifuges are supposed to be checked every six months for the rotations, the how many rotations in a minute, um, the centrifugal force, all that good stuff. Microscopes should be cleaned and adjusted regularly. Um, they can be cleaned and adjusted in-house. Okay. Uh, you do not need to have somebody from the outside, some other external company, come and clean and adjust your microscopes. So if you have one person who understands the microscopes in the laboratory, they may be in charge of cleaning and adjusting all of the microscopes in the lab. Autoclaves. Um, I don't know the last lab that I worked at where I actually worked with an autoclave. So that's kind of interesting. If you do have an autoclave, um, you the temperature should be checked regularly, but then the spore testing um, to make sure that the autoclave is actually autoclaving effectively should be done on a weekly and or monthly basis. Um, balancing any kind of balance or, or scale that you have should be checked annually to make sure that it is working properly. Okay. So this is just a, an example. Okay. When you have a received and open date, you have all this, all these good things. This is just an example of what you might see in, in the hospital. Um, wait, let me go back. Go back twice. Notice initials. You put the date down, and you put your initials next to it. Period. End of story. That's all I got to say. Okay. Um, Media.qc. I did talk to you about how the media, media has to be QC'd. That it comes from the manufacturer. The manufacturer qual and did the quality control testing, made sure that it was working properly before they packaged it up and, brought, and sent it out. The problem is that between there and where you are, there is a whole bunch of people handling it and whether it was stored properly, whether, you know, how, how, what's happening with it. So, um, so you have to then QC the media to make sure that it is working properly. Um, the three QC that are used, or the three me types of media that are, um, that may need even more testing than what it normally is, um, where you actually have to see if you can grow particular organisms and the, the, the media will inhibit specific organisms, um, are medias that will grow Neisseria or Campylobacters, um, maybe some others for some other specialty organisms and chocolate auger because chocolate auger has to be able to recover certain organisms or it's no good to us and you want to look to see if any of the plates are broken if they're if the the media looks like it's 
normally should. Um, whether any, if it's there's any contaminants on there, what's the is the amount of moisture in the plate excessive? Um, sometimes you guys see really drippy plates. Most of the time in the real world, not here, um, we purchase our media because we don't have time to be making media. Um, we're too busy dealing with patient care. So you test with the organisms that are supposed to be tested, but um, the, the, um, implementation of in-house media it takes a bit you can't make it you're not supposed to make it today and be able to use it this afternoon because you have to be able to test it against known organisms to see if the reactions are going to be right to make sure that it's working correctly so it's going to be at, you know you could make it today but i guarantee you're not going to be able to use it till at least 24 to 48 hours from now so you know it's not something that you can wait till the last second and then yeah i'm gonna use it and then, yeah no you gotta qc it first okay. so see you can see that chocolate has to you have to put homophilus influenza and icerium meningitis on there you need to make sure that they both will grow um GC, which is gonococcus media, um, Gembeck is also a Neisseria gonococcus medium. Um, they, you need to go and look at all these things because yeast will sometimes grow on it. Other Neisseria species will also grow on it, but we're just looking specifically for the Neisseria gonorrhea when we're, when we're trying to recover. And Campylobacter, Campylobacter jejuni is an intestinal um, bacterium that has to grow in specific environments. So it grows in a weird um, atmospheric conditions and also grows at a very high temperature. So it grows at 42 degrees Celsius, which is higher, you know, pretty, pretty much higher than um, the body temperature and so you, you have to make sure that it does what it's supposed to do um media observation log i'm not going there you'll see them when you get there uh <clears throat> if a failure happens it failed to do what was supposed to happen okay um so then what did you do about it okay you get rid of it or you try and fix it. If you can't fix it, you just throw it away. <clears throat> so reagent QC, you do reagents every day that you do use them. So we use um, A disc or bacitracin disc. We use catalase, coagulase reagents, oxidase reagents, indole reagents. You use your gram stains every day. Maybe even some AFB stains. That everything that you're testing at bench. Um, you have to do QC on every single day. Um, the panels that we use to do our identifications and susceptibility testing, we also test those every single day. So we test them with different organisms each day so that through the week's time, we cover all of the different organisms that are needed on the quality control list. So, antimicrobial susceptibility QC, this is pretty interesting. Um, you have control organisms. Now, here's the interesting piece of this. We have organisms that we get from um, microbiologics or ATCC, and they have an ATCC number, and each individual organism has its own reaction patterns to certain things so you can have 15 different staphylococcus aureuses but they'll have different antibiograms to them so this one might be susceptible to penicillin and resistant to um 
oxacillin. But then the next one might be susceptible to all the psyllins and resistant to erythromycin for some weird reason. So uh, it's uh, it's very interesting. Austin, we had a mess of staph aureus uh, years ago that just all of a sudden um, they used to be all susceptible to penicillin. Now all of a sudden, no, not anymore. Now you can barely find one that's susceptible to penicillin or ampicillin. Um, that's when we started getting harsh on that. You need to stop using antimicrobial everything, antibacterial everything. The antibacterial um, hand lotion is not helping things. <laughs> it, it's been a rough ride. Okay. But we do them on these control organisms and we want to make sure that, that everything is done appropriately. So you're using all standardized media that the right depth and all this stuff is is there the the antibiotics have been handled properly they haven't been left to sit out on the on the table at room temperature for two weeks and then you're going to try and run qc on them because that's probably not going to work um and we're checking to see if the instrument is actually doing what it's supposed to be doing um, and it could be an instrument as easy as your inoculator, or it could be instrument that is actually reading the plate. So you um, do susceptibility testing on these control organisms. If you are trying to implement new antibiotics into your regime, you have got to do the testing for this like 30 times, 30 different days um, to make sure that that is going to work the same way every single time that it, the new method is going to be compatible with the old method. Like there's a whole mess that goes with it. But after you get the susceptibility, the antibiotic tested, and you have verified that yes, it is repeatable, it is accurate, then you only have to do it once a week. Thank God. Okay. What did I just tell you? We do all this testing like a hundred multiple times during the week anyway, but it's only required once a week. Okay. And anytime that you um, get rid of a, new, a method, because you've adopted a new method, all of the stuff that goes with that old method, um, you have to keep for two years after you discontinue use of that method. Um, it tells you who you should be using for what drugs and whatnot. It's there's actual protocols, <coughs> personnel competencies. Uh, one of the things that we do is we review the reports that the people put out. Um, we can go in and we're having conversation with them and actually observing them doing their work. We could give written exams. You guys getting written exams um, in the workplace is probably not going to happen very often. But we do do proficiency testing. And the proficiency testing will help us to see perhaps some of the deficiencies that maybe one tech has over another. So what happens is unknown specimens come in, you treat them just like every other specimen, every other patient specimen, you put the results out, we send them off to um, CAP and they tell us whether or not we got it right so it's that's good uh, it's you always have more than one person around if you are unsure of something ask somebody else to verify it isn't hard so and sometimes um, all of the results that are reported out have to be reviewed by someone else, by the technologist, the lead tech, the supervisor, somebody, um, to just to kind of verify to make sure that something weird didn't happen. 
uh, every year you have to have some sort of documentation of your competency. Um, you should have documentation of your continuing education. Always, whenever you do some sort of continuing, continuing education, make sure that you uh, submit the a copy of the proof that you did it to your um, lab manager and or HR department so that they because it's mandatory to keep track of everyone's continuing in. <clears throat> so stock cultures we always have stock cultures on hand because we have to continually have those um, ATCC organisms ready to go to perform QC with. So we always have stock cultures, which means that we keep them alive for a period of time. We, we sub them every, at least once a week. Um, most of them can handle being subbed just once a week. Some of them have to be subbed every day. Some of them can be subbed every other day so that you're putting it on fresh media and that it'll keep it alive. Um, I have a hard time keeping some things alive because we're not here every day. So I can only grow them from Monday through Friday. <laughs> that gets a little expensive. So I try to stay away from teaching you guys about those too often because sometimes it takes it two to three days to grow in the first place. It gets really interesting. Now, um, if you have organisms that you need to keep, okay, you put them in broth, you soak, um, there's these little porous beads, you put them into the broth, the broth then go with the beads go into a freezer, um, should be set at negative 70 degrees Celsius so that then they are will maintain their integrity their dna after you subculture repeatedly for so many times you have to start a new culture from scratch from a new atcc bug or from one of these aliquots these frozen critters because you keep repeatedly just taking the same thing and giving it new space to grow, it's going to change over time uh, because there are periodic mutations that happen in the course of the life of an organism. <clears throat> so um, the broth that you put it in shouldn't have any sugars in it because then it could change the pH from fermentation and could kill some of the organisms. Um, so <clears throat> some of the broths that we use are TSA or TSB rather, tryptocase soy broth, chopped meat broth, um, Shadler's broth is pretty good, but the, the bead method, I love the little bead method, you put the thioglycolate broth in there, put the beads in it, freeze them at negative 70, or you could, um, take the organism and treat it with liquid nitrogen and freeze it that way. Or we can do lyophilization and lyophilization is, is freeze drying. So you freeze it and then you have this vacuum that pulls all the humidity out of it. Um, so it's complete desiccation after, after freezing. Uh, QC manuals, uh, we have to have a QC manual and we have to have all kinds of manuals that tell us all the things that we are supposed to be doing and all of the rules and, and responsibilities and procedures are right there at your workstation all the time. Every year, employees must re review all of the manuals in the areas where they work. If you're finding something's wrong, if you're finding something that we've changed that never got changed in the manual, you need to tell the supervisor so they can make those changes. Um, 
if you are working as a generalist in a laboratory and you're working all areas of the laboratory, you have a very fun couple of weeks trying to read every single manual and all the procedures in the whole entire lab. Okay, so it gets really interesting. And what they typically do is they try to fix all the procedures right away, right before Joint Commission comes and you have two days to read all these manuals and you're like, uh, hell no. What are you people, crazy? So, <clears throat> They have to remember that there are generalists. Joint Commission and the College of American Pathologists would like to see policies on how we do all parts of the specimen resulting. So how do we get from test to result? There are actually policies and procedures on each step of the way. And if we can pinpoint a weak link, then we have to figure out how we can improve on that based on what's going on. So there are, there's always an improvement plan in effect. There is always some sort of quality improvement or a quality assurance um, ass assessment happening. Um, most times there's mul there are multiple quality improvement assessments happening at one time. So it's very important for each person who works in the laboratory to know the role that they have in the process and what they are supposed to be doing to help improve performance. <clears throat> the vision and mission statements, it can be, you know, you have vision and mission statements of the facility. Each place in the facility should also have their own vision and mission statement or their vision should be able to support the mission statement of the entire facility. So it's, um, it's very interesting when you have new employees and the new employees come in and you're like training them and you're going through all this stuff and, and you go through the vision statements and the, the mission statements and they're like, yeah, well, I don't agree with that. And I'm like, yeah, how'd you get hired? You know, it's your job now, so you're still on probationary period. You better get with the program or you're not going to be here. But any problems that you have are, they're an opportunity to improve and to excel in what we do. So it is truly, uh, I know people say that sounds like a bunch of malarkey, but it's not. You're always trying to be better. You're always trying to do better than what you're doing currently. Um, you're always looking for holes and you're looking for, for something that is going wrong that we can maybe make better. And if you're not that kind of a person and you just want to come in and not worry about anything else, don't expect to be going too much further than you're going to be a bench tech for the rest of your life because you're not going to become a lead tech. You're not going to become a supervisor. You're not going to become a lab manager. You're not going to do anything if you don't buy into quality improvement. Uh, process monitors are things that look at a specific process and they look at the process from beginning to end. So they're like, okay, this is what happens. So they're, we look at that data very quickly, very easily. You, you, you can see problems right away in that process. Okay. And then there's an outcome. So how did that process affect the patient care? So what happened with the patient with that, when that process fell down on that time, that's what an outcome monitor is. So, and then the outcome monitor tells us, okay, so, well, we relate the the machine went down. We relate getting this, the the CBC out on this person, um, so they were delayed getting their their packed cells 
well, they were delayed getting their type and screen done because we didn't realize that they needed pack cells, and then they were late getting the pack cells because the type and screen hadn't been drawn properly. So this person suffered for a little bit longer and ended up in the hospital for two more days because of the fact that the CBC analyzer had gone, and then they fell through the, the cracks. Right, and we had a delay, we had a delay, then we had another delay, then we, right? So it was a bunch of little processes that fell down and had a, a, a direct effect on this patient and their care. Okay. The focus monitors are the things where say, okay, so we figured out we had a problem. How can we fix that problem? What can we do to make this work a little bit better? have a backup analyzer that's a good idea yep mm -hmm. okay <laughs> um so you have to plan these things appropriately you have to be able to measure them you have it has to be something that you can measure that you can do something about you have to have a specific like okay if we do turnaround time monitors all the time like on stat CBCs, stat um, urinalyses, stat uh, basic metabolic panels. We get a stat basic metabolic panel line. How long does it take from order time to result time? Okay. Um, how much, to, how long does it take to get a stat uh, cerebrospinal fluid count? Right? How, did, how long does it take us to get the whole cerebrospinal fluid panel out to the physician from beginning to end? Okay. Minus the culturing piece of it, but like all the counts, all the stains, all the, all the chemistries, all this. How long does it take? Fluids, you get an hour to do counts. Okay, so eh, you better get on it right away. Because... Um, if you've never done this before and you load your chambers wrong and or not so perfectly and you, your counts don't match within a certain percent you have to redo them right there you go now you're counting twice so but these are it's a way to collect the data you have to design it so that you can collect the data you can see what your where the issues are and then you have to develop a plan as to how we can fix that so and sometimes you can have all the plans in the world and it's just not working it's just not working and that's when you have to have a big meeting with everybody and go okay we tried this we did this we did this we did that can somebody else come up with some sort of an idea as to how we can make this turnaround time faster so it's sometimes it takes more than a couple head to be able to figure out what the answer is and sometimes it actually needs to be looked at from someone outside of where you are. Another set of eyes sometimes helps. So you incess, you plan them, you design them, you, you start taking your, you're collecting your data. And then once you collect the data, then you look at it. Um, you compare it to other previous month, the next month, somebody else in another laboratory using the same equipment that you use has a better turnaround time than you do we don't understand how or why right um how do we improve on these processes so there's a lot of things that you can look at and when we run into an issue you need to have um some sort of a of, of action form and there are all kinds of different acronyms for these forms. Um, I went through three different types of forms and acronyms for we found the problem, we, we identified the problem, we assessed it, the action that was taken and the outcome that went with it. I can't even remember what the heck they were, but it was like because I can't remember any of the names of the, the acronyms, but that was basically what you did. You identified, you took action, and you and then you followed up for the outcome. Um, 
<clears throat> so there are forms that you will have to document, 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 and you will have to put your name on them. If anybody else is involved, you also need their names, the date, the time that you talk to them. Just saying. C Y B. Okay. So <clears throat> here's an issue we found from a blood culture that one, but nobody was trained to draw the blood cultures. So then the patient had to drive from urgent care to have a phlebotomist somewhere else draw the blood. Yeah, um, that should not happen. Just saying. Okay. So who are your customers? Um, patients, primarily. But... Somebody else has a bigger hand in what happens with our patients and what tests are done and things like that. And those are the people who are the insurance companies. The insurance companies are hugely involved in the healthcare system. And the insurance companies are what drive medical costs. How much we get reimbursed, where how much we charge is, is now um, a federal thing. I mean, like, there's all kinds of stuff. But... The people that you're trying to serve ultimately are the patients. The people who talk directly with the patients are their doctors and nurses. So you're serving the doctors and nurses so they can serve their patients. Okay. Everybody has a different way of looking at what is a good outcome. Okay, so... I keep telling people over and over and over again, and I will continue to tell you guys over and over and over again, we're going to try to get things done in the most cost-effective way possible. So you don't repeat things five times. You go in and you, you look at this one, this one thing and figure out how to get from A to Q in three steps or less. Okay? It's possible. Now figure out how to do it. Okay. If you're on the bench for a long time, it's easy to figure these things out. But for newbies, you're like, I don't get it. But that's why we also have flow charts. We have procedures on what to do in this instance. Okay. So you get this, you do that. You get this, you do that. You get this, you get to do that. Right? And it tells you what your next step is. So don't feel completely lost. We have things written out for you. <clears throat> when you find a problem, let's fix the problem. See how fast this is going? Um, if the problem is identified but, and, but it's not actually fixed, you haven't resolved it, you have to continue to monitor that. And if you figured out a way to fix it, you have to monitor it again to make sure that the resolution is going to actually resolve the problem. So the new corrective action is actually going to fix it. If not, guess what? You're going to be doing it again and try to figure out a new way to fix it. If you finally have gotten it fixed, and you can repeat that you don't have a problem with it, not just one month, but different months, then you need to start looking at a new process. Okay. Um, the industry or profession's best practices are well known to most people. Um, if they're not well known to most people, that person has been sitting with their head in the sand for a really long time. Uh, so we constantly have continuing education, salespeople contacting us. I, there, there's a lot of things that are happening to help you keep up to speed with the latest technology, the latest things that are coming out. They, they, you need to find out what's the best way to do things. A lot of places are no longer doing stool cultures. They are just doing the stool um, pathogen panels in the Ceph IDs and, and things like that. So it's uh, what I'm going to be teaching you is actually kind of outdated um, for most facilities, but some facilities are hanging on to those TSI slants that we did last week. So it's, it's crazy. Um, 
the commercially purchased monitor so you can actually go and get um, you can purchase a monitor to see if you have problems in your system that's a lot of money but if you're already doing cap proficiency testing sometimes the Q probes will be um, integrated in there they'll actually include Q probes with your cap surveys um, sometimes you have to pay more for them or let or it's the same amount it just depends on how often you have your Q probes done so um, <clears throat> once we get I'm, I'm stopping here for a minute hang on a second